Today we will hear from author William Steele. Uh, April 21st, 2019 marks the 30th anniversary of the film Field of Dreams, based on the book Shoeless Joe by W.P. Kinsella. Kinsella and his work were thrust into the limelight back in 1989 with the release of the blockbuster movie. Having been granted full access to Kinsella's personal diaries, correspondence, and unpublished notes, and with hours of personal interviews with Kinsella, his friends, and his family, biographer William Steele offers insight into Kinsella's personal life intertwined with the critical analysis and commentary the author's fiction has inspired. Author William Steele grew up in Washington Courthouse, Ohio. He is a professor of English at Lipscomb <coughs> University in Nashville, Tennessee, and he wrote his master's thesis and doctoral dissertation on W.P. Kinsella's baseball stories. Please help me welcome William Steele. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I've been telling people, if something goes wrong here, it's completely, uh, technology and I don't always get along, so here's hoping that this, that this works. Um, how many of you have seen Field of Dreams? I, which is the dumbest question ever to ask an audience in Iowa, right? Um, did any of you know Kinsella when he was here? Okay, this makes me feel a little better because um, I, I was having, having breakfast this morning with somebody who teaches at the university. We were talking about how, his, how Kinsella's relationship with um, the Iowa Writers Workshop was, like many of his relationships, um, it, it had its ups and downs, uh, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, before I get started, I do want to thank uh, the festival, John Kenyon, his, his crew, the folks at the Graduate Hotel. This is really a phenomenal event, and, and I know that you all appreciate it, but this is the sort of thing we need more of. Um, that, that, you know, not every city has something like this, and I spent some time doing the literary walk uh, last night, uh, you know, and as a Vonnegut fan, if the weather cooperates, I'm going to go by Vonnegut's house later. And um, I, I went by 335 South Johnson, which is where Kinsella lived um, when he started writing Shoeless Joe Jackson Comes to Iowa, which was then turned into uh, Shoeless Joe, which was then turned into Field of Dreams. Um, and I debated, you know, do I go knock on the door, you know, because that would be creepy. So I did the somewhat less creepy thing where I just stood in their front yard and took a picture <laughs> and then hoped I, that they don't come out, right? Because why are you taking a picture of the house? And, you know, so I, I kind of did the, like, you know, click and run uh, sort of thing. So, um, but I am looking forward to, to exploring. It's a great city, a great venue, and I just want to thank John Kenyon and, and his crew uh, and the folks here at the library for putting this on. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I fell into this project. I, it's always strange when somebody calls me a biographer because I don't think I am. Um, there are very few certainties in this world, and I, in front of God and everybody today, will say I have no intention of ever writing another biography. Um, I, I'm good. And I also realize how spoiled I was because I've talked with a lot of biographers. When I first got this, um, email from Kinsella, which I'll talk about in a moment. I asked Lee Lowenfish, who wrote the definitive biography on Branch Rickey, who signed Jackie Robinson to the contract with the, with the Dodgers. I said, Lee, you've written this great book, great critical acclaim, you know, all of it. Give me, I've never written one, right? The only biography I've ever done is one about my grandmother when I was in the seventh grade, and I made up so much of that. Like, it's actually fiction. <laughs> And, um, and, and he said, well, the best, exam or the best advice I can give you is write about somebody who's already dead and then kill his family. <laughs> that wasn't incredibly helpful because at the time, Kinsella was alive and I needed to talk with him. Uh, and I think his family would have frowned on me um, killing them. And so... Um, I, I had, as was mentioned in the intro, I, I did my master's thesis on, uh, on, on I, or, um, the film Field of Dreams, the novel Shoeless Joe, and the father-son relationships. And so you fast forward six or seven years, and I'm working on a dissertation. And I said, you know, well, they, they let me do baseball once. Let's see if lightning can strike twice. Because, I mean, let's be honest. You mentioned baseball. They're like, no, it has to be something <laughs> academic, right? Which at that point of my career used to bother me. I told students last week, I'm at the point in my career now where I don't care if you think it's academic, right? It's very comfortable to be able to write about things like baseball and, and knowing that it does have cultural relevance and, and all of that, right? That's why we're here. And um, so I did my doctoral dissertation on identity in, in Kinsella's uh, work in his baseball novels. So that was published in 2011. I, I published it because Kinsella had stopped writing. He hadn't published anything in 13 years. 
and he had said he was done writing. And of course, once the contract is signed and my manuscript is off at the publisher, there's a press release that says, Bill Kinsella is coming out with a new baseball novel. I said, <laughs> of course he is. Um, and so he emailed me, um, and the, the email is, is wonderful because if you know anything about Kinsella, he hated literary uh, theory. Um, he, he, he had nothing good to say about literary criticism. He was an atheist, and uh, he was somebody who, who hated his time in academia. He taught for five years at the University of Calgary, which he called uh, Desolate U. Um, strangely, they didn't really invite him back very much after he left. He said when he left, he didn't just burn the bridges, he nuked them. Um, and so I get this email, so somebody who hates literary theory, hates academia and is an atheist. And at the time, I was teaching at Oklahoma Christian University. Um, my degree is in literature and criticism, and my entire professional career has been an academic. And so using baseball language, that's three strikes, right? <laughs> and so I get this email that says, uh, you know, I, I borrowed your book. I, I still, why didn't you buy it? Um, whatever, we, you know. Um, he said, I, I borrowed your book and I read it, and, and this is, these are his words. You didn't mess things up too badly. <laughs> Not that I didn't mess them up. I didn't mess them up too badly. I'm like, you know what? Coming from him, that's high praise. I'll take it. And he said, um, you, d you don't jump to absurd uh, conclusions like so many academics tend to do. OK, again, I'll, I'll take that. And I actually asked him the first time we met, can I use that on the dust jacket of my next book? You know? Steel doesn't jump to absurd literary conclusions like so many academics tend to do. He said, yes, um, although I suspect that they won't let you. And he was right. Um, <laughs> so Kinsella, you know, a lot of us, you know, he was a father, had two daughters, uh, Shannon and Aaron, who were absolutely, and I never do one of these types of events without thanking them. They were absolutely wonderful. Kinsella gave me access to literally every scrap of paper that he had. I mean, and he was a hoarder. Um, which, for a biographer, is both a blessing and a terrible curse, um, because when the, he, there were there were five different acquisitions with the Library Archives Canada, and Kinsella um, was originally paid cash, a lot of cash for his first round of papers. After that, the government decided they were going to give him tax credit. He wanted the cash, and so he said, "Well, if you're only going to give me tax credit, I'm going to fill these boxes with everything: unopened junk mail, uh, bank receipts." Um, uh, hate letters that he would write to businesses that he felt scorned him in some way. My favorite is the one where he wrote a letter of complaint because how dare you charge me 25 cents for creamer for my coffee. I bought the coffee, you should give me the creamer. Um, so if anybody has an idea for a book, you know, the, the um, business hate mail from W.P. Kinsella, 1982 through 1997, I have all, I will give you that material. That is my gift to you. Um, also, if you want um, bank receipts for 13 years of W.P. Kinsella's life, that can be volume two of your work. And again, I'm, I'm here to share it with you. But he was a father. He was somebody who, you know, during his Iowa day, this is from his Iowa days or his, his early Calgary days. And so when he was here, you know, he, um, he was, was spending a lot of time developing. He'd already published uh, some stories, but really came uh, into being a writer while he was here in, in Iowa City in the 1970s. Um, he also... Um, the, the older he got, the more popular he got, he took on the sort of, um, one critic called him the uh, Canadian version of Buffalo Bill, which I can kind of, if you like, look the right way, uh, can maybe see that. Um, of course, he said after he published Shoeless Joe, by default, he became a baseball expert, right? And people wanted to ask, you know, TV Guide, remember TV Guide, right? So those of you who are nodding, you know, you're showing your age. Um, some of the... Some of the college kids are like, what's a TV guide? Um, they, they had him write an article uh, about hot dogs in baseball uh, stadiums. And so he was like, well, you're going to pay me? Sure, I'll, I can give you 1,000 words, 1,500 words on hot dogs. Um, but during the, the World Series with the Blue Jays and the Braves, this is Kinsella. This is one of the, the photos that circulated after his uh, death in, in 2016. 
Um, and, you know, he, he wrote the intro for a book about the Blue Jays running the World Series uh, those two years in the, in the early 90s. Um, he's somebody who, uh, for all of, his, uh, all of the stories about him being gruff and angry, was somebody who really connected well with his fans, uh, never turned down opportunities to do book events, to sign books, to speak to writers, uh, and to encourage writers. Um, now, there were some times when he got a little bit um, prickly uh, with potential writers who wanted to spend more time talking about writing than actually writing. And so when he was teaching, he would say, so you want to be a writer. What have you, what have you written? I said, well, I'm thinking about this idea. Said, well, what have you written? Well, I've got this idea, you know, and it kept coming back to if you're not writing, you can't be a writer, right? Even if it's really bad, get something down on, on paper. And so um, he was somebody who um, really, and he would come back here and teach during the summers. Um, and, and a lot of the, it, it's interesting going back and reading his evaluations from the students <laughs> um, because some were very, uh, you know, like, this is great, like overflowing with how great Kinsella was. And others said, he was just mean, right? He, he said, my stuff isn't very good. And so when I brought this up to Kinsella, he said, well, it, it's not very good. Like, what do you, <laughs> you know, there, there's not a nice way to say, like, I'm sorry. Like, you know, you, you can't, you, one of the phrases somebody said, and this is a little crass, so forgive me. He said, you can't polish a turd, right? <laughs> and then if it's bad writing, it's bad writing. Um, and, and so he was somebody who uh, really, you know, a, a, as far as that goes, um, knew how difficult it was. He struggled for years wanting to be a writer, never felt as though he had a chance. And so when he finally became a writer in his 40s, right, he was, it was early 40s before his uh, first book came out, he really took advantage and was trying to make up for lost, uh, for lost time. And so Later on in his life, um, and he was hit by a, by a car in 97 and didn't publish anything for 13 years, um, he played competitive Scrabble. Um, and so, it, you know, he was, he was somebody, I love this picture because, I mean, he took his Scrabble, like, it's not a joking matter. This is, I didn't know that cutthroat and Scrabble could be used in the same sentence, but talking with Bill Kinsella, they, they certainly could. Um, this is Kinsella at his home in uh, Yale, British Columbia, which I know you've all all been to. Um, the 150 people who live there, um, they, they appreciate your business. Um, it used to be a mining town. He and his wife, the older he got, he got a little bit more reclusive, uh, not unlike the J.D. Salinger character that he writes about in, in Shoeless Joe. Um, and yet people would still find him and you know, seek him out. And one guy showed up and wanted to have a catch with W.P. Kinsella, right? Um, and, and he's also somebody who, uh, after a few years, um, Maybe this will work. There we go. Um, he finally started writing again. He finally started to, to go back and blow the dust off some, some short stories that he had been working on and, and developing some ideas for screenplays and things like that. Um, but my favorite is, um, you know, as, as he got older and, and, and became uh, comfortable kind of with where he was at, uh, he published a few things online and, and things like that, um, would reap these rewards. Um, he started going out and doing more readings again and uh, an entirely new generation of, of uh, readers were starting to come to Kinsella's literature. He's known in Canada for his, uh, what he calls his Indian stories, right? The indigenous First Nation uh, stories that um, brought a, all sorts of uh, criticism about cultural appropriation and things like that, which we can talk about later if you want. Um, but, but he kind of dismissed that, right? He said, I write fiction. You know, I can write about whatever I want. Um, and so in Canada, he's known for those stories. In the States, of course, he's known for his baseball stories, um, most of which are set in Iowa. Um, and most of the ones in Iowa are specifically set in, in Johnson County. Um, the last two years of his life, in, in 2015, his 80th uh, birthday, um, just a few weeks before, the essential W.P. Kinsella came out. Right? So this is him uh, the, the week of his 80th birthday doing a book reading there. Um, but he, his health was, was declining. He was in terrible health, had complications with diabetes and, and, and some, some other physical ailments. And so he, uh, in the summer of 2016, Canada had passed Bill C-14, which is the Assisted Suicide Death with Dignity Act, and uh, he opted for that. So um, the day before he, um, he passed away on September 16th of... Um, of, of 2016, 
he posted this, which tells you a little bit about who Bill Kinsella was. Um, when somebody asks me, well, what was Bill Kinsella like? I said, well, the day before he died, this is his, this is his last parting shot to the world, right? Which I like it, but it's a little strange when I get an email saying that, um, you know, dad is, his daughter sent me an email and said, dad is going to be leaving this earth on Friday. This was on a Monday. And so I kind of followed up and checked. And when I saw this, I thought, that's, you know, that is, that's, Bill Kin that's the Bill Kinsella that I really, really uh, like. Um, the thing that got it all started, and really the reason that, we're, that I'm here talking about it, is because of the novel that he wrote in, in 1982, Shoeless Joe. Um, how many of you have read the novel? OK. Um, started off as a short story. Um, Shoeless Joe Jackson comes to Iowa. And it was included in a, an anthology in the late 70s of the best Canadian writing of 1978. And in Boston, Massachusetts, there was a editor's assistant, or assistant to an editor. He wasn't even a, a, an assistant editor. He was an assistant to an editor, which means, you know, sweeping up the office, getting coffee, that sort of thing. And he was at a bookstore in Boston, and he, he reads a blurb that is literally two sentences long about a short story called Shoeless Joe Jackson Comes to Iowa, in which the narrator hears a voice telling him to build a field so that um, Joe Jackson can come back and play baseball. And Larry Kessenick, the assistant editor for Hope Mifflin, um, reads this and writes a letter to Kinsella, pre-email days, right? It's, it's interesting to go back and look at all of these letters. Sees this, uh, writes this letter and says, I'm sure you probably have a line of people already wanting to edit this. This sounds like it would be a great novel. Kinsella said, I've never actually published a novel. Um, uh, I would need an editor. Why not you? Right? And Kessnick's like, OK. Um, and so they start working on this. And of course, it turns into, in, within a nine-month period, uh, he, he took this from not even having an idea about a novel to writing a novel, uh, Shoeless Joe, that wins the Houghton Mifflin Fellowship and then goes on and, and uh, gets a Best Book Award in, in Canada and, of course, leads to the film. Uh, Field of Dreams, which this was from, uh, is from the collection of uh, Phil Robinson, uh, the director, the film's director. And this is when Bill and his wife, Ann, whom he met here in Iowa City uh, when he came to the workshop in, in uh, the 70s, um, they met here, uh, were married here, and then went to, to Calgary. Um, but this is on set in the summer of 1988 uh, up in Dyersville. And uh, I, as I was doing the research, I would talk with, with Phil Robinson from time to time. And um, he said, it was funny, he said, oh, I was, I was cleaning out some files, and I found this picture if you want to use it. Nah. I'm, you know, who wants this unpublished picture that nobody's ever seen? Yes, send me the, well, yes, I want the picture. Um, you know, and if you've got the script laying around, I'll take that. Uh, strangely, he's not responded to that. Um, but, but this is why we're here, right? This, this is the reason that so many people, particularly here in the United States, know of, of Bill Kinsella. And so the way in which I came to this story is fairly interesting. Uh, in the summer of 1989, there were a group of us who were going to uh, see movies. And of course, when you get a group of teenagers together, they can never decide on, on what to do, right? Eight people went to go see Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I made the brilliant choice to go by myself, which is usually how I spent most of my time going to the movies in high school. Um, I, I went to go see Field of Dreams because I thought this sounds really cool. It's about baseball, and you know, I, I grew up in a farming community in Ohio, and so I thought this will be great. And so I go watch this, and come to find out there's a book that this thing's based on. And so I thought, well, I'll I'll go read that book, and then it kind of snowballed from there, right? I keep thinking every time I'm finished with W. P. Kinsella, something else comes up. I thought I was finished watching the movie, then I read the book. I thought, well, that was fun. I'll do something else. And then the master's thesis, and then the dissertation, and then the first book. And then Kinsella sends me an email two weeks after he sent me that original email. And he said, oh, this is my favorite line, authors with a lot less reputation than mine have had their biographies done. <laughs> I said, OK. And he said, I, I've turned down people in the past because um, 
I didn't like their style or them. Um, I, I turned down some graduate students because I didn't think that they were up to the research. He said, but, but I'm, I'm interested to know if you would want to do a biography. I have to admit, looking back, this was in the fall, this is November of 2012. Had I known what it was going to entail, I, I probably would have paused before I answered. But I was like, yeah. Famous last words, how hard can it be? <laughs> never, ever, ever ask that question. Those of you who are writing, never use that sentence. Just strike it from your vocabulary. Um, and he said, I'll give you papers, letters, archives, and again, not realizing how much stuff there was. So I flew up to um, Yale. Well, I flew into Seattle because Yale, interestingly enough, doesn't have an airport um, or a gas station. Um, I, I fly in and visit him, and he sends me home with a, with a liquor box full of almost 40 years of his diaries. Right? And he's like, here, you can have these. I still have them in my closet because he's like so not sentimental. He's like, eh, I don't need them. And I asked his daughters, and they said, hey, see if somebody else wants them. Um, and so they're, they're in my closet um, right now. And uh, eventually we'll be in the Canadian archives. I just haven't quite gotten them, them ready yet. But he starts giving me all this information. We talk fairly regularly. Well, as those of you who have either read a lot of biographies or have tried to write a biography, no. One interview leads to, oh, you should talk with this person. I talk with you. You should talk with these three people. And it, sort of, it, it never stops. And so at some point, you just have to stop writing or stop researching and start writing. On the day he died, uh, like I said, I knew there were very few of us who knew that he was going to be dying on September 16th of 2016. His agent, who was my literary agent, Carolyn Swayze, um, sent me an email and said, hey, I'm in France, and you're, you know, if it's okay, we're going to give your phone number, your email out. It, it, you're probably going to get a couple of questions. Um, a couple of questions turned into my phone like blowing up and melting in my hand that afternoon. Um, and, and my daughter, who was eight at the time, came up and she said, Daddy, I'm, I'm sorry that Mr. Kinsella died. I said, well, honey, you know, you're trying to explain it to an eight-year-old. I said, well, honey, he was old, he was sick, you know, he was, he was ready to go. And she was 100% serious when she said this. She comes and pats me on the arm. She says, but daddy, now you know how your book's going to end. <laughs> and I know I am 100% confident that Kinsella would have appreciated that, <laughs> right? But I also realized that she was right because I, I wasn't quite sure how this was going to come together because he thought his career had ended in 1997 when he had gotten hit by a van and he lost his sense of taste, his sense of smell, and his ability to write creatively, right? So he could do op-ed pieces, he could do book reviews, but he couldn't, he just could not write creatively. And then when his wife, his fourth wife, Barb, was in the hospital, he started to pick up some things and kind of take them as he was sitting with her and just started tinkering. And you know how it is, those of you who are writers, you, you, you have a long dry spell, and then you, you have something that's like, well, that, that's not too bad. And, and he, he kept tinkering with it, and it turned into the novel uh, Butterfly Winter, which was published in uh, 2011, right? And so um, he, he had this long, um, you know, prolific career as a writer, was, was originally known for his short stories in Canada, and then started writing the baseball novels um, here in the States. But it's interesting because um, he wasn't, a, a, what he said, a, a real writer until he was in his 40s, right? His first book comes out in 1977. Um, and so at that point, he's 42 years old. And he felt at that point as he was an old man already, right? Um, I don't agree with that, especially since 42 is now in the rearview mirror. That's not old at all, right? But Kinsella said, for so many years, I wasted uh, my life doing dead-end jobs just to put food on the table and to put a roof over my family's head. And so... For Kinsella, he, was, he always had the mind of a writer. He was always looking for stories. He was always um, uh, you know, scouring newspapers for these snippets to be turned into short stories later on. And, uh, and, and he would continue to write. Well, he, he started publishing things in the newspapers in Vancouver, uh, in Victoria, British Columbia. And as, as he was working through, uh, he, he owned a pizza place, right? He sold insurance for a while. He sold the Yellow Pages. Remember that? sold advertisements in the yellow pages. Um, I, I was telling this story to a class, and some 19-year-old kid raises his hand and says, I had to explain what the yellow pages 
are. Yeah, I'm, I'm at that point of my life now where <laughs> next week we're going to cover eight track tapes. Um, but I look, you know, as we're going through, you know, all of, as he's going through all of this stuff, um, he, he says, I still want to be a writer. And an interesting story that he told a lot, and, it, and it's in the book, when he was in high school uh, in Edmonton, they have the meetings with the counselors, right? And they do these uh, evaluations, like personality tests, career tests. And um, he said, he sat down with the, with the counselor, and the counselor said, uh, Bill, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a writer. He said, no, no, what do you want? Like, you have to have a real job. You can also write, <laughs> like, which, again, saying this in Iowa City, right, the city of literature, right? Go get, go get a real job. Um, and, and that infuriated him. Years later, when Kinsella went back to that high school and told that story, he told a group of high school students, there's a special place in hell for that counselor <laughs> who would tell a kid that what you want to do isn't something you should do. And he said, you know, there's a special place in hell for him because of that. Because of that, for years, I wasn't able to write, you know, because I didn't think as though it was something that I, that I could do. And so that was something that he harbored. And he could, he could hold a grudge like nobody I've ever met. Um, and so, and, and I asked him years later, I said, you know, do, do you still harbor that resentment? He said, absolutely. Why would I not? Because I didn't start writing until I was 40, in my 40s, you know. So he, he's doing all these jobs, and he and his wife, uh, Mickey, opened up a pizza place. And, and to give you a little bit of insight into Kinsella's personality, the first time he ever made a pizza was on the day they opened the restaurant, <laughs> right? And so it's kind of like, I'm going to open a pizza place, okay? You know, it's sort of like, I'm going to be a writer. What are you going to do? Well, I write. Well, if you're going to open a pizza place, what do you do? You make pizzas. Um, and it worked out well, became fairly successful. He got to the point in his late 30s where he said, if I don't go back to school and, and go, back to my, you know, go back to university, um, it's going to be easy to never do this. And I need to be a writer. And so he goes to University of Victoria, and he um, gets into the creative writing program, and he graduates, and, and his, um, one of his mentors, W.D. Valgridson, a uh, famous Canadian writer, um, was one of his mentors. And he, he basically told Kinsella, he said, you're not getting enough stuff published because you're writing two pages too much. He said, your stories are already over, and you don't know when to quit. And so he took out a pair of scissors. <laughs> and now, now, whether or not this, OK, this is Bill Kinsella telling this story. And so this may or may not have happened, right? But he, he apparently took out a pair of scissors and said, you don't need that, and, and here's your short story. Immediately, Kinsella said that week he started selling everything. And he said everything he wrote he was able to sell from that point on. And so he, uh, Valgerson had, had a connection to Iowa, and so he suggested that Bill uh, Kinsella apply uh, to, to come to the Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop. And so he did that uh, and left his family, moved down here, and attended the Iowa Writers Workshop uh, and grew really frustrated because he said there were people who came here and they talked about writing, they read a lot, but they didn't write very much. And he says it's really frustrating when I'm cranking out a short story a week and there are some people who are still just revising the stories that got them into the program in the first place. All right? And he says this, this is a problem. Um, and so he, he goes and, and gets a creative writing uh, teaching position at uh, University of Calgary and spends five years there from 78 to 83. And then once Shoeless Joe sold and he was able to squirrel away enough money, he said, I've got enough. If I, if I do my math correctly, I've got enough where I'm going to be able to live for two or three years. And so even if I don't sell anything, I'm, but I'm going to go all in, kind of like the pizza uh, job, right? I'm going to push my chips in and, and really make a go of this. And he did that, and it turned out pretty darn well. Uh, over, the over the next 12 years, he published at least one and sometimes two books a year, um, you know, short stories and, uh, and novels. And when, at the height of his career, there was all of the, t this is when in the, in the um, late 90s, early 2000s, the cultural appropriation debate had been going on for a while, where people were saying, can a, um, can a white man write from an indigenous perspective, right? And Kinsella's take was absolutely, right? He said, you know, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, right? And, and he wasn't from Denmark, right? Shakespeare wrote Othello and he wasn't black, 
right? And so he, she, he, Kinsella had this whole list of stuff that if, if you're only allowed to write about things from your perspective, it's going to be a very limited selection of fiction, right? Uh, and Kinsella says, I don't know who would want to read about a you know, white Canadian college professor, right? Um, but what he did, there was a, a story uh, called Ileana Comes Home, and he viewed it as kind of a take on um, guess who's coming to dinner, except reversed. And so what happens when there is a group of uh, indigenous people on a reservation that the daughter brings home a white man and says, you know, this is my boyfriend, right? We're getting married. And he intended it, what he, he said, and this is his line, he said, I meant for it to be a bittersweet commentary on race relations. And then he took it in to the class and read it out loud and people started laughing. And at first he was offended, right? But then the more he read it, he's like, oh, no, that, that line's pretty funny, right? And he put in some really inappropriate jokes, right? Um, some that, you know, and, and even back then probably would have been considered racist. Um, but he's like, you know, he said, he said, I'm writing from this perspective, right? I know nothing about the indigenous people other than I've passed by this reservation. Um, and it was interesting because a lot of the criticism came from the white academic literary theorists. He would go and read on reservations, and the, the indigenous people loved his story. I've seen, I've read the letters from people who were like, finally, somebody gets us. And then there was one guy who wrote and said, I have to admit, I was surprised to find out that you were white, right? I thought you were one of us, right? And so, you know, Kinsella kind of used that to say, see, this is, you know, I'm, my job as a fiction writer is to make you believe that I know what I'm talking about. His thing was, if you give me two or three street names, if you give me a couple you know, different types of like flora, fauna uh, type stuff, I can make you think I know your city better than you know your city. And if you look at some of his stories, right, he'll mention you know, walking down Johnson Street, right, turning down you know, whatever. I forget. I, I was, as I was out for a run last night, I was like, I, I, he used that one and that one, and I ran over the river, and I'm like, wait, so in the story, the Iowa baseball confederacy, like, this is the one that flooded, and, you know, the game for, the, if you've read that one, the, the game goes on for 40 days and 40 nights, right, which for an atheist, Bill Kinsella knew the Bible better than, probably better than I do, for sure, um, and, and, and he said, it's great mythology, it's a great story. He's like, and I know that, and I loved when he started saying this, you literary critics, I'm like, Okay, don't lump me in with the rest of them. Remember, I'm the one who didn't screw it up too bad. Um, he said, uh, you guys love looking for those clues. And so I'm, I'm gonna, gonna give you the stuff you're looking for. And so he said, my job is to make you believe as though I've been there. And, and this is real. And so he was talking about some very serious subjects, alcoholism and drug abuse and rape on uh, these reservations. And, but he's able to do it from this 18 year old Cree uh, perspective. And so a guy named Rudy Weeb, they were friends early on in Kinsella's uh, tenure at, uh, at, at Calgary, um, really started to become highly critical of him. And Kinsella was planning on not writing any more um, of the indigenous stories until Rudy Weeb started that. And then he said, you know what? Not only am I going to write them, I'm going to write a bunch more. And he had a couple of collections after that as kind of a you know, stick in the eye for the critics who said that you shouldn't do this. Um, they ended up winning like the, the Leacock Award um, for, for humor in Canadian literature, right? And, and they are, I mean, they're, they're funny, right? Now, whether or not they're funny for the right reasons or you know, whether or not the humor's appropriate or not, that's a different discussion. Um, but he's writing those types of short stories for the Canadian audience and he's writing the baseball stories down here. Right? And again, a lot of them, small town, idyllic sort of you know, Iowa landscape, um, that when you're coming, like I did yesterday from Nashville, where it's 97 degrees and you come here, this really is, like to borrow from Bill Kinsella, is it heaven? Yeah, pretty much, right? Um, because I just left like 98 degrees and 1,000% humidity. Um, but Kinsella said, you know, I've got two different audiences. I've got, I've got the Canadians who expect this, and I've got the Americans who expect this. And interestingly, what he said was, I wanted to republish those indigenous stories in the States and just change it to like South Dakota, right, or Wyoming. And the publisher were like, nah, they're better. And he, was, he said, we're losing a lot of money. We could have, we, we could have made a boatload of money by, by setting these in the States because the Americans would have bought them. Um, I also asked him shortly before he died, I said, uh, do, you know, do you have any, do you have any regrets? 
anything you would have done differently? And that sentence wasn't out of my mouth a half a second. And he said, yes. And I'm like, oh, this is good. This is where I'm going to, this is the good stuff. He said, I regret that I didn't get an agent until my fourth book because I lost a lot of money trying to negotiate my own contracts. I'm like, well, that's not the regret. I was, okay, but I'll, I'll take it. Uh, and so I immediately, you know, got an agent. Um, and, and so, um, it, but, but this idea of, you know, he's got multiple audiences, is known for multiple, uh, you know, different, different types of writing. Um, and then later on in, in his life, um, he became, after the accident, when he started writing again, he said he went from being a really uh, a type A driven personality to more of a, a kind of a, a laid back personality. But somebody asked me, he said, what, what, if you could give an example of what Bill Kinsella was like at different parts of his career, um, what would it be like? And if you've read his, um, if you've read his, his baseball stories, you know that there is a, a large emphasis on an absent father, fathers who are gone, fathers who are dead, um, some sort of distance from the father. And part of that goes back to when he was a senior in high school. Um, Kinsella's father had been um, diagnosed with a stomach cancer and was dying. And his, his father had basically renounced his faith, had given up his faith in the Catholic Church, and then um, had gone back to the Catholic Church after, um, after he was diagnosed with stomach cancer. And Kinsella was infuriated with him because of this. And he said, um, his dad, and this is when his dad said he had gone back to, uh, to the church, he said, um, his dad apologized to Bill for what he did, saying, you can't understand how they indoctrinate you. Not offering much of a response at the time, Bill later thought, I wanted in the worst way to denounce him as a coward, to chase that smelly old slob of a priest out of the house, to tell my pious relatives to get out of the house and take their religious medals with them. And years later, right, this was in the early 80s in his private notes, he wrote this, even after all these years, this is 40 years after the fact, even after all these years, I cannot forgive my father for what he did. Not having the guts to stand by your principles is unforgivable. I mean, I would have stuck by him if he'd killed or robbed, but to be such an incredible coward, not to have the fortitude to stick by the principles by which he'd lived his life, and to crawl back to hypocritical simpletons he had scorned, right? So when you start looking at this, and I asked him a year or two before he died, I read that in his notes, and I said, you know, you wrote that in 83. Your dad died in uh, 53, right? Um, do you still feel that way? And he said, absolutely. He said, it infuriates me that my dad went back. And he had some rather colorful adjectives to describe the priest and to the religious uh, family members. But then you fast forward to where he was a successful author. And he was at a place where, where he commanded a good audience. And, and um, he went around and, and he would speak anywhere anybody wanted him to, libraries, community centers, book festivals like this. And um, he got frustrated with the crowds. And he said that uh, in one event he had fumed, and he wrote this in all capital letters, the worst crowd I have ever read to. He said there were about 18 people, <laughs> these are his words, there were about 18 people with the animation of parking meters, including, <laughs> including a male librarian who couldn't say my name. So he sat down and typed up a list of requirements that if you want me to come speak, Here's what you need to remember. These were his ground rules. I insist that your local libraries or school libraries stock at least 75% of my books, all of which are in print. Check to make sure my books are, capitalized, available. The Indian stories are very often stolen from libraries. Two, promotion. The most serious problem I encounter is that an organization will go to a lot of trouble to book an appearance, then relax and do nothing, assuming a crowd will automatically appear. And then in all caps, a large crowd requires work. If you are not prepared to work, please don't invite me. I insist that your organization guarantee a turnout of at least 50 people. I don't know how you do this, right? Like, I, maybe I should start. Like, I'm not going to get up unless you fill, you drag people in, right? But, but I'm not getting up here until every seat is filled. He says, if you're not prepared uh, to work, please don't invite me. My experience is that any town, no matter how small, can get 50 people together on a few hours' notice for a shower, curling banquet, or a prayer meeting. I deserve at least a similar amount of attention. <laughs> Point three, 
schools, all capital, I do not babysit. I will read and answer questions in front of any number of interested capitalized school children. Those students must be exposed to my work. They should be read or they should they should be read at least one story of mine and have some idea of who they are going to actually see. Four, accommodation. I have to reluctantly refuse to be housed in private homes because I have been repeatedly frozen and housed in crim criminally substandard conditions. I don't know who's been putting him up in these houses, but apparently it was just, it was atrocious. I prefer to eat in restaurants. Please check with me if you plan a private dinner as I am diabetic and have many restrictions. Point five, this is his summary. If these requirements frighten you off, good. <laughs> we probably wouldn't have gotten along anyway. <laughs> I'm not at a point in my career where I can do this. <laughs> And I don't think that I would want to in any event. But the idea uh, is, as, as Kinsella got older, and, and he began to appreciate what his legacy was going to be, and I asked him, um, and, I'll, and I'll pull this together with this, and then open it up and answer any questions that you all have. Um, two weeks before he died, um, he goes into the hospital. We were supposed to talk on a Thursday afternoon. I had to bump it till Friday. I called him Friday, and his daughter said, well, we took him to the hospital this morning. He was having some bleeding issues. And um, so we stayed in communication. Uh, Aaron and I were, were talking uh, back and forth via email, and um, I was checking in how he was doing, and he sent me an email uh, that she had typed up uh, for him and, and said, um, I'm not going to leave the hospital. Uh, it's going to be a month or so. This is before he, he decided to use the assisted suicide law, Bill C-14. And he said, um, he said, I'm not going to leave the hospital. He said, in the coming weeks, the, the drugs are going to be taken over, and I'm, I may not be coherent. And so if you have any questions, um, ask them now. Now, as a biographer, this is a really weird position. When you know someone is dying, like literally dying, and you want that person, as a human being, you want that person to spend time with his family. But you've also got, I had a dozen questions that I had already written out, and I needed them answered. And so I, I was at my mom and dad's house in Ohio that weekend. I'm like, I don't know what to do, right? You spend time with your family, answer a dozen questions. And so I sent him six questions. Um, it was the best way I could think of to sort of split the difference. And so now I freed up time to spend with your family, but I really need these questions asked. And I asked him, I said, what is your legacy going to be? And he said, what I want is for people, when they look back, is, is to say that he was a writer who left them with a tear in their eye and a smile on their face, right? So they're able to to have that little bit of sentimentality, but they're also able to have, um, they're funny, right? It's, he, he wants you to enjoy what he left behind. And it's not a bad legacy to have, and one that I think that, you know, looking back now, three years after his death, that people have come back to, and, and as they go back and reread the stories, uh, they realize that, that his humor is, for the American reader, um, oftentimes not recognized. Right, because the, the humor is in the, the indigenous stories and not so much in the baseball stories. For the Canadian reader, they're also realizing the cultural significance. When Major League Baseball decides we're going to have a game in a cornfield in Iowa, right? it's because of this film. This film doesn't happen without Kinsella's novel. right? Uh, and there's all sorts of great stories about how the film came to be as well. But, um, but anyway, there's Bill Kinsella. I'm happy to answer any questions about the writing process, about Kinsella himself, or to just sit here and stare awkwardly at you for the next 15 minutes. So there's a microphone coming around. Oh. Yes, ma'am. So um, in, in your experience uh -huh. of Bill Kinsella with his writing, did he really seem to be passionate about the topics he was writing about, it, or was it a bit more mercenary? Um, because they were making money. Yeah, uh, so the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, yes to both. There are these things that he's, uh, I mean, he's passionate about the craft of writing, right? But, and I expected, you know, I, I, I want there to be this, um, the artistic side of me wants there to be the author who says, you know, I want to create good art. A student made the mistake of telling him, I don't care who reads my work as long as I'm creating good art. And Kinsella went, Kinsella said, get used to starving. Because if you don't care who buys your stuff, you're not going to eat. And so you better start thinking about, can I market this? And what he said, what people said, why are you, you know, you've written all these, all these baseball stories. He said, it's like finding a vein of gold. You don't just mine a little bit of the gold and say, and I'm, I'm going to leave the rest for somebody else. 
He said, I'm going to keep mining that until there's not a nugget of gold left in that vein. And so it is, in that sense, it is very mercenary where I'm, I'm a hired gun. You want fiction. You expect baseball. You like these baseball stories. I'm going to keep giving them to you. Um, he had a, a couple of really strange collections, one called the Alligator Report um, that are the, he called them his Brodigans. Any of you read Richard Brodigan? Uh, one, of, one of Kinsella's favorite writers. Um, and one of the few fan letters that Kinsella ever wrote was to Brodigan. Um, and, and in fact, the, it, the night before he died, Brodig he had Brodigan's novel, um, oh, what's the name, uh, Watermelon Sugar, um, read to him. His best friend's wife read it to him the night before he passed away. Um, he, he loved that book. Um, but these didn't fit into any of his story, and he knew they were going to make money. And so on one hand, he said, I'm going to create these because they're the stories I like to write. But he was only able to write those stories after he had a steady income coming from the ones that, that he knew were going to bankroll the projects that he wanted to do. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Yeah. Any others? We'll get you here in a second. You said when he was teaching, uh, he would tell his students they weren't, they weren't, uh, yeah. the, the writing wasn't that good. And I wonder if that's more a sense of, of him knowing he was a good writer, right? Or did he really, did he want to help them or not, right? Was he more interested in himself, right? Yeah. Or in, uh, in teaching the students? That's a great question. And what's, what's funny is, so he would have these creative writing classes uh, that one year, had 70 people, right? Seven, zero, way too many people for a creative writing class. And so he came in the first day and said, most of you don't need to be here. His standard line was, <laughs> he, his standard line was about 75% of people on any university campus um, shouldn't be anywhere, allowed anywhere near the campus unless they're working in the cafeteria. Um, he said most of them, the, the, re, the only requirement to be here is that you're able to fog a mirror. Right? And so if you're breathing, yeah, we'll take your money, come on in. And so he had these huge classes. And so he would come in the first day, and he actually got called in by his department chair and said, you, you can't do this. He would say, most of you don't need to be here. Um, and so rather, you're going to fail anyway, so you may as well just take something that you can pass. Um, but then there were these students. And there was the, the student who said, you know, I don't care you know, as long as I'm creating good art. And he took care of that problem. But then there were the people who really wanted to be a, a, a writer, right? And he was so, I, I, and please don't misunderstand me. I, you know, the stories about him being grumpy are, you know, they are legion. Um, but, but he was a really um, good supporter of people who wanted to write. And so he said, I know it's difficult, and it's a slow go, and you're going to get a lot of rejections before you get any acceptances. But keep at it, because even if it's only 1% better than what you wrote last time, it's still 1% better. And the next time, it may be 1% better than that. And then it's going to be 1% better than that. And he was always very grateful for Bill Valgertson, W.D. Valgertson, who took out the scissors and said, now you can publish this. Um, because he said, I needed somebody to do that for me. And so I want to do that for you, right? And so um, he would, his evaluations were largely very positive uh, from the people, particularly in Iowa, when he would come back to the summer workshops. Um, they, were, they were incredibly um, um, insightful, showing that he did have this side that was, a, he was a good mentor. Um, he, he did encourage a lot of people that way. Um, and he would have writers who showed up at his door or would send him manuscripts and, and he, would, he would try to, he wasn't always able to read everyone, but he would try to give some sort of feedback and, and recognize, I know it's a difficult thing, uh, but keep at it. If you really want to get published, you got to keep working. Um, and, and he said, you know, sometimes you're going to have to get up at 5 in the morning and run your hands over hot water to get them moving. But if you've got kids and a wife who are depending on you, you've got a job, and so you find out when you can write, and you sit down and you write. And he got into a system where he would do four pages a day for two days, so write four pages, four pages, and then on the third day he would edit what he had written or get caught up on per personal correspondence. And I tell students, I, I took that model. Um, once I read that in his notes, I took that model and started doing it. I would do two pages a day, so two pages, two pages, edit, and I still write by hand. I love felt tip pens and legal pads, like it's as God intended for us to write. And, and then on the third day, I would type, right? And so I would start editing. And I told students, you know, if you sit down at the beginning of the semester and say, I'm going to write 160 words or 160 pages this semester, where are you going to find time? But you can write two pages a day. Right? And so you do two pages, two pages, 
edit, two pages, two pages, edit. So over a four-month semester, that's 162 pages. I know because I did it, right? And it's not always good. In fact, there's some really bad pages that are there. Um, but it's, it's better than thinking, boy, I wish I had written 162 pages. Um, and so he was somebody who really used his own experiences as a frustrated wannabe writer that once he was successful, he was tremendous at being able to share his frustrations and, and the things that helped him get over that to help students get published. So. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was wondering um, how do you think he would respond to the news that they're building a baseball field in Iowa just so two major league teams can come play? <laughs> he would love it. And I know this because I was talking with the, with the guy who drove me over uh, from, the, from the airport yesterday. He, uh, he never, Kinsella never understood why they didn't charge admission to Field of Dreams. How many of you have been to Dyersville, Field of Dreams? You, you can show up. And you know, the, the film comes out in April, of, April 21st of 89, which is, you know, that's, the book was released April 21st of this year for a 30-year tie-in. Um, and he never understood why a few weeks after that, when people started showing up at Don Lansing's farm, that Lansing didn't say, yeah, give me 20 bucks and you can go out on the field. He's like, that's what the book's about, right? You're making money off this thing. And he's like, I don't understand why they're not doing that, right? Like, well, I, I don't know. I, again, I kind of like that, you know, they show up and you play catch and all of this. But Kinsella's like, they can do that and pay, you know? So, <laughs> He and I, we didn't always agree on things, and you know, and that was one of the things I'm like, but, but I like. So um, he would lo absolutely love it because here's a way for you know you're able to make money, and for him, I promise you, the thing he would say, let's do a book event, let's tie it in, <laughs> right? Um, and, and this is one of the things he wrote a short story called The Last Pennant Before Armageddon. He wrote this in the early '80s, and the idea was that there was a radio show where the manager for the Chicago Cubs. They were in the thick of a pennant race, and um, he had gotten a phone call on this call-in show that says, I'm here to tell you I have a prophecy. The Chicago Cubs will win the last pennant before Armageddon. Here's the really creepy thing. The day that Kinsella died in 2016, um, the Cubs clinched the division, went on to win the pennant, and win the World Series. <laughs> All right? And we were talking about this in the weeks leading up to his death. I said, you know, you, your story may be very prophetic. And he said, we need to reach out to the publisher and have them reissue that story. That's great. <laughs> I'm like, this guy, even in his last days, is like, how, you know, yeah, here's, here's a way we can make. And, and, and I'm sitting there thinking, that's kind of brilliant, right? Now, as a Pirates fan, I really wish he had written it like, you know, the Pirates are going to win the last pennant before Armageddon. But I think that actually may be the case, so. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got uh, two questions. Sure. One, I'd love just a short answer. Like, so, do critics lump his writing into like Harlequin romance, or do they say this is somebody you should study to be a great writer? Um, there are people. He said, um, "If you ain't read, you ain't dead." Or if you ain't dead, you ain't read. Sorry. If you ain't, and he said the reason that a lot of his books in Canada weren't studied is because they didn't view him as being a serious writer. Um, that has changed, right? If you go to a sports lit class, in the, you're going to read Shoeless Joe, Iowa Baseball Confederacy, Magic Time, any of those types of books. So, yeah, he was, he, that's how he viewed it. Well, and his frustration with academia is, I'm publishing a ton in Canada and nobody's teaching me. Um, so, yeah. um, I'm curious about these 40 years of journals and kind of like how personal were they? And, and was there alignment in world view over those 40 years and how did that yeah. align with kind of and how much of it actually made it into the book yeah a lot of it made it in and what i had to do was go back and verify dates because you don't just take his word for it right and so there's that trickiness of well he said this and he he also on the april 1st one year he was talking about you know i've been offered the job of heading up the iowa writers workshop and i thought i never knew this like do any of you know this yeah because he wrote that entry on april 1st and I'm like, I called him, I said, I didn't know this. He's like, what date did I write that? I said, April 1st. He's like, oh. I'm like, I hate you right now, right? And he also would make up family events and interviews with interviewers because he said, if you're not going to do your job, I'm just going to pull a fast one on you. And so he had this story about this recipe that his grandmother Drobny, you know, Baba Drobny had. And he got the recipe like out of some magazine or something and made up this whole story to go with it. And nobody, ver so I asked him, I said, you don't have a grandmother Drobny. He goes, I know. 
I'm like, why did you say that? He goes, because the guy was lazy and didn't do his research, you know? They did show a shift in worldview. He became more conservative. Um, he was already conservative, became more so in his later years. Um, they are personal in the sense of, you know, when he was frustrated with somebody or, or had a falling out with somebody, he would write that down. But a lot of times it's just kind of the mundane. I wrote, and this was really insightful as a writer, I wrote six pages today, edited four. I wrote 13 pages this week, you know, and, and you could track his productivity over the years. And he did this each year comparing it to the year before. Because, so he was hyper competitive with himself and with other people. Um, and so they're, they're really insightful as far as that goes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, how you doing? Good, thanks. This has been just fabulous. Thank so, you. So thank you for, for coming. I'm just curious that at being a, a, you know, a high school English teacher retired now that, that I'm almost in hearing you talk about what um, Mr. Kinsella, in terms of what writing does, uh -huh. um, I'm almost like sitting here, like I'm almost embarrassed by the fact that I'm so in love with symbols. Yeah. Because he has J.D. Salinger in the novel. Yep. J.D. Salinger creates Allie's, and Holden has Allie's baseball glove uh -huh. with poetry written in green ink. Yeah. And I've always wondered just what poets did Allie Caulfield write on his glove. I know. You know, because he doesn't tell us. And would Mr. Kinsella say that that glove is just merely part of the story? or that that glove actually means something that transcends the story? So he would say he would throw in symbol, he would throw in things because, and the, again, Kinsella's words, he said it, it's a little crass. There were two things he said. One is uh, it gives literary critics um, a, a wet dream. Um, and the other one was an erection, right? And so he's like, you know, this is what excites, you know, and he used the you people, you know, as a lit, I'm like, I mean, it's, I don't care. Um, but his, his whole thing was, um, it means what you want it to mean. But he would put symbols in there, right? So in the Iowa Baseball Confederacy, right? You've got the guy Gideon who plays the trumpet, right? And then it rains for 40 days and 40 nights. And if you're scratching your head going, I've heard this story somewhere before, <laughs> try Genesis, right? The, the original is a really great story. Um, but yeah, his whole thing was, you know, if that's what draws you to the story and gets you to read it, great. But like you, I like, I like a good symbol, right? And especially when students are able to see what's going on with symbolism and how you can use a, a myth to talk about something bigger. Um, but then there was also, it's very much grounded in reality. And so um, Anne, his, I would love to have met Anne. She died of breast cancer in the early 2000s. And um, she did the interviews that if you've seen the film, Field of Dreams, you've, I assume you've seen it. Um, so when James Earl Jones is sitting there in the bar interviewing Moonlight Graham's friends, um, those were actual questions and answers that Ann got from Moonlight Graham's friends when they went to Chisholm, Minnesota. And they actually, I didn't feel as bad stalking the, the house on Johnson Street last night because Kinsella did the same thing. They went to um, uh, New England, to the town um, where Salinger was living. They didn't go knock on his door, but they just wanted to get a lay of the land. And so he. He, you know, he had it grounded in reality, but kind of sprinkled it with a healthy dose of symbolism, too. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking that. We have time for one more question. And then I am also, by the way, on the panel about what you're reading here in about 30 minutes. And so if we can take the party down the street to the Masonic Lodge. So. Um, I was just curious, because uh -huh. I love the relationship between Ray and Annie. Did yeah. you feel like, I mean, he sounds a little cynical and very funny, mm -hmm. um, but did you feel like he was a little bit of a romantic, and maybe that oh, yeah. was based on his first wife, or yeah, any sort uh, of gems Yeah, not the first wife. No. Oh, not the first wife. Okay. No, definitely not the first wife. You should read the biography. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. No. Books for sale, um, right and outside. I think, by the way, all of you should read. Um, <laughs> and you can't really tell here uh, a freckled redhead, Annie freckled redhead and write this this really sexual relationship and having read the letters that is also accurate um, and and so yes but he was a romantic loved the idea uh, he, he was he was the relationship between he and Anne was is incredible in a story in its uh, in its own um, that's that's worth exploring but yeah absolutely and the, and the romanticism that goes along with the nostalgia of baseball Right, I think they, they work really well together. Uh, I, I thought the earlier question about the Harlequin romance, you know, he, he, try, he and Anne tried to write what he called a bodice ripper. Um, and I've never seen the manuscript. I have looked all over for it. If any of you find it in a 
nook or cranny in Iowa, please let me know. Um, but apparently it was pretty bad. Um, and the, the, they wrote him back and said, this, no, no, stick, stick with baseball. Um, so, but thank you all so much for coming out. I appreciate it. So thanks.